dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied. Within your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. One thing, one thing I ask and I
All right, you can have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, hey, if you're visiting, we're really glad you're here. My name is Michael Hanson. I'm the lead pastor. Uh, and before I forget, well, there we go. Before I forget, good morning to our live streamers. And if it's a little cooler in the room today, that's because we're on a heat fast uh, just in this room. So for those uh, watching online, feel free to join us. Turn your heat off and open some windows and uh, participate with us. But hey, if you are visiting today, we're glad you're here. And if you could, after the service, go back to our info counter and fill out a, a Connect card. We'll get a bit of information about you, and, and then I'll reach out to you uh, uh, next week. If you came wanting to give, awesome. There's boxes in the back where you can drop your tithe off. Uh, of course, you can also go to our website, vcdc.org, or church, our on, church online app. All right. Please turn your attention to the screens as Sonia has this week's announcements. Hi, my name is Sonia. We're so glad you're joining us today. Here are this week's announcements. We have our Big Walnut Friends Who Share Christmas Collection taking place now through Sunday, November 28th. Each year, BCDC has the privilege of partnering with Big Walnut Friends Who Share to come alongside the local community with Christmas boxes. This year, we have been asked to supply 100 boxes of eight count hot cocoa packets. These will be included in the gift that each family receives with their Christmas meal. Please drop off your donations at the table in the lobby during the week or at our weekend services. Next is an upcoming opportunity called Thankful Giving for Refugees that will run from Saturday, November 18th through Sunday, December 3rd. In the next few months, the Columbus-based nonprofit agency known as Community Refugee and Immigration Services, is set to resettle dozens of families here in Central Ohio. This agency strives to resettle each refugee individual and family into a furnished living space stocked with the basic items necessary for daily living. They do this through a welcome kit, which is a collection of essential items each family needs upon arrival. We are excited for the opportunity we have as a church to participate in collecting items towards these welcome kits. For more information, please stop by the table in the lobby next weekend or check out our church center app, vcdc.org, or call the church office. Next, we want to remind you of VCDC snow policy for our weekend services. We follow Delaware County levels. If there's a level one snow emergency, we will have services as normal. For a level two, we will have services as normal, unless informed otherwise. If there's a level three, services will be canceled. For ministry events during the week, please check for an email or call the church office. Our featured announcement is our annual Women's Christmas Brunch, a simple gift, on Saturday, December 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We invite you to join us for food, fellowship, special music, and testimonies from three of our women, Allison Kitchen, Beth Hackworth, and Devin Mowry. This event continues to be one of our largest outreaches, so be praying about who you could invite, maybe a friend, coworker, neighbor, or a family member. We're looking forward to celebrating the simple gift of our Savior's birth together this Christmas season. There will be several opportunities for men, women, and youth to serve before, during, and after the event. So stop by the table in the lobby after service to sign up to volunteer, buy tickets, and make a donation. Please note that there will be a limit of four tickets purchased per person for the first two weekends. We hope you will join us for this special event. At VCDC, we value small groups as a way to nurture spiritual growth and connection within our church body. This week, we are featuring the Northeast Columbus Men's Group, meeting on Saturday morning. This group, led by Jim Doyle, is currently in a study on the book of Ephesians. We have many groups, mixed women's and men's. You can find info on all of them on our website or on the small group card wall in the lobby. Please call before you attend to confirm when a group is needed. That's all we have for you today. Enjoy the rest of the service. Thank you, Sonia. Hey, this weekend we're celebrating our veterans. So if you are in the room and are currently or have served in our military, would you stand up? We just wanna honor you. Come on. Yeah, all right. Thank you for your service. Yep. Bless you guys. Hey, and also, you may have noticed on the way in that we're, uh, we're selling VCDC apparel. What? I don't know. This is, what, this is what you get for the person who you don't know what to get them for Christmas. So check it out afterwards. We've got all kinds of sweatshirts and uh, ski hats, toques, whatever you call them. 
and uh, lots of cool stuff. So check it out. All right, our Church of the Week, Vineyard Church of Morrow County, uh, pastored by Jerry and Jeannie Stevens. We've been praying for a church every weekend since we started. And uh, this has been a hard year for them. I had breakfast with Jerry last week, and uh, COVID-365 has, has visited them. And it's, uh, so they have been having some considerable health issues. And so let's pray for them as they're gathering today as a church. So, Lord, we thank you for uh, Vineyard Morrow County. We pray, Lord, would you encourage Jerry and Jeannie today? Lord, would you heal their bodies and just, uh, just cleanse them from any bugs, anything, Lord? Just... Give them health. We pray blessing on them. We pray blessing on the church there. Uh, just surprise them with your presence today as they gather. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Please welcome Heather Kamira as she continues our series. Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. We are happy that you're here with us this morning. Whether you are new or you are joining us online, or maybe this is just your church home. We're just really glad you're here. Who here has heard of George Mueller? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so some of us, yeah. He lived in the 1800s. Look at that guy. He looks like such a happy guy. Uh, he mostly in England, actually. He's known for the orphanages that he ran. But I'd say he's uh, a modern-day Daniel. A modern-day Daniel, because he was a true man of prayer, if you've ever heard some of his stories. He really depended on God for everything they needed. And these stories of waiting on God and some of the crazy, amazing answers to prayer that he encountered and had uh, throughout his life is so encouraging. Definitely, if you've never read some of his stories, check those out. But one such story is when early on, Mueller began to pray for five of his friends. And after many, many months, one of them came to know the Lord. Ten years later, two of his friends were converted. And it took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. Mueller persevered in prayer for his fifth friend until actually Mueller passed away. But throughout those 52 years, he never gave up hoping that his friend would accept Christ. And interesting enough, that soon after his funeral, that fifth friend was saved. Have you ever prayed for someone or something, not just a couple times or once, but like many, many, many times, <laughs> like dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, Maybe over the course of weeks or years or even decades. Maybe it's a friend that has struggled off and on throughout their life that you've been praying for. Or maybe it's someone in your family who doesn't yet know Jesus. Or maybe it's a desire in your life that you have a long to see come to fruition or, or even a chronic illness. But for, but, but what we do when we feel like our prayers are not being answered is really important. What do we do when we start to doubt? And, and I bet there are some of you here today that if you're honest, you've all but given up on praying. You feel like your prayers are just, what, bouncing off the ceiling. You feel like, well, does it really even make a difference that I pray or not? Well, no matter where you find yourself today on that journey of prayer, I really believe this message is gonna be for you this morning. I believe that God is gonna really speak to some of you who have been praying for a very long time, believing that God would do something significant and maybe not seeing the results yet. I pray that he would really encourage you this morning, but I also pray that he's gonna encourage some of you that you've all but given up on praying and you've been disappointed, you've been frustrated in your prayers, and you need the kind of encouragement today that is real, that is going to infuse your life with the real kind of hope you need today. Well, we are in continuing our series entitled Living in a Foreign Land, where we have been looking at the life of Daniel. And today we are looking at chapter 10 in Daniel, and I have to say I really love this chapter. 
I always have. Um, much of Daniel is apocalyptic literature. Uh, who here remembers what apocalypse means from the recent series, yeah, that we did on Revelation? There we go. It means to pull back the curtain. That's what apocalypse means, to pull back the curtain. And these last three chapters in Daniel do just that, especially in chapter 10. And it pulls back the curtain on the, I would say, more real reality of the unseen battles around us. And here, Daniel is told, and we are told very clearly that much is happening in the unseen spiritual realm that we do not see. And one of the unspoken exhortations in this chapter is of prayer and of fasting. And at this point, think about it. Daniel, if you've been throughout our series, he has been praying for decades and decades. <laughs> Ever since he was brought to Babylon from Jerusalem as a teenager, he has been standing firm in his faith, believing that God would rescue his people from the exile they found themselves in. You know, the book of Daniel does a really good job at giving us this big picture view of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in a world that doesn't know him. Living in a culture, in a culture that is changing very quickly and that doesn't look like the life that Christ is calling us to. You know, in 1 Peter 2, it says it well when he says that we are what? Foreigners and exiles. We as believers are foreigners and exiles. Why? Because this world is not our home, is it? This world is not our home. We are living in two stories at the same time, and there is this incredible tension living in this place of exile. But God's heart is that we, just like the people there in Babylon, the Jewish people there, would learn how to be faithful followers of Jesus in a world where there are principalities and powers that try to cause us to fall away, to drift away from the way that Jesus is calling us to live. And sometimes in ways that we're not even aware of. But if we are not people, and if we are not people that are actively praying, seeking God's truth, and abiding in his presence, the promise in scripture is that we will drift away. We will wander away from the God we love. And I know that's a serious warning, but it is found very clearly all throughout scripture and especially in apocalyptic writing. It's really important what we do while we're in exile. And now maybe you've heard this old saying, I love this saying, as some of you know it, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Why is that? It's because prayer is powerful, and we need to be reminded of that today. Prayer is powerful. It is a weapon that helps us not only push back against the tide of culture that tries to keep pulling us in, but it's also, it's also against the unseen battles around us. And what prayer really do, does is it opens the door to allow Jesus in. That's what prayer does, to allow Jesus in, that he might ex exercise his power and bring more of his kingdom into our families and into our schools and into our neighborhoods and into our cultural and political climate that we find ourselves in. When we don't know how to respond, when we don't know how to deal with all the hurt and the evil and the brokenness and the darkness that we see, we should fall on our knees and we should pray. And prayer, as we will see throughout this story, is such a crucial, a crucial piece of what we are called to do as faithful people living in a foreign land. So let's just do that right now. Let's just take some time to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Well, Lord, we do. We, we just call upon you and we say, come, Holy Spirit. We just open the door right now. And we say, let your kingdom come and your will be done and I pray that you would, you would encourage our hearts this morning with your word today. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, these last three chapters of Daniel are really just one apocalyptic vision, and chapter 10 is actually just a really long introduction to that vision. Let's start reading by looking at verses one through three. In the third year of Cyrus, 
king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. We find Daniel at the beginning of this chapter, he is in the middle of a fast. He's mourning and he's praying over a concerning problem, a concerning problem. Now, whatever this is, he is grieving, he's weeping, he's crying, he's lamenting, that's what this word means here. And for full three weeks, it says he ate no choice food, no meat, or wine, and, and I want you to remember this. At this point in the story, Daniel is in his latter years. He's actually in his probably his late 80s at the time. And then, I mean, that's pretty significant to have someone in their later years significantly restrict their diet like this for three weeks. Um, Daniel's not the young teenager anymore refusing meat and wine of the king in that first chapter. Here he's in his maturity of years. And now he's willingly restricting his diet again because he is so deeply troubled. Now the question is why, and, and we're not told exactly why, but we know actually from that first, that first verse that it was, that it was the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And what's beautiful is that we have other accounts of what's going on at the time, especially in the book of Ezra. So this means that the Jews have been back in Jerusalem for two years. They had, in the first year of Cyrus, been released to go home. And really what Daniel had prayed for for so long had finally happened. Uh, yet, what we find out also in Ezra 2 is that only a small portion of the Jewish people in Babylon actually returned to Jerusalem. And it gives an exact number. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket compared to how many stayed back willingly stayed back in Babylon. And I mean, they can return home now, but they don't want to go back. Maybe because they got comfortable, you know, they'd lived there a long time, they'd raised their kids, maybe they became prosperous, maybe they just became absorbed into the culture. But the idea of uprooting and roughing it and going to a place that's desolate didn't sound too appealing to many of them, even if God was there. Another possible reason for his grief is that those that did go back weren't very successful. In those two years, they had not been able to establish the monarchy again. And it took them seven months just to clear the rubble from the temple grounds. And eventually, they were so hassled by their enemies that their work came to a screeching halt. So, Maybe Daniel is mourning and fasting because for all his prayers for the people to return home, here he is grieved because only a few have returned, and those that did return were unsuccessful. Now let's move on in the story, verses four through seven. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, and I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. <laughs> so Daniel's concerning problem gets eclipsed by a commanding presence, a commanding presence. Daniel sees this powerful, <laughs> just think about it, this powerful luminescent golden figure dressed in linen, which was a symbol of righteousness and purity, with a belt of gold from Uphaz, which is you know, the Persian gold mine. I mean, who is this heavenly man? You know, some have suggested uh, that it was the angel Gabriel that's mentioned earlier in Daniel. Others suggest that it's the, the angel Michael, or maybe an unnamed angel of equal rank. 
<clears throat> now, when I started to research this passage, I really, I never considered this until I started to read about it more, but another strong possibility is that this is a vision of the pre-incarnate Christ. The pre-incarnate Christ. If you've ever read the New Test or the Old Testament, you've read about the angel of the Lord, who is oftentimes referred to as God and even worshiped as Lord, uh, and it's about almost 50 plus times in the Old Testament. And uh, so you've, you've read about that before, so this is not uncommon. But I also want you to listen to a description of another person that John sees in the book of Revelation chapter one. I want you to listen to if there's any similarity in this. You know, John, remember, he hears a voice and he says, this voice says, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And in verses 12 through 18, it says, I turned around to see a voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, and the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of the rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And then I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who is this? This is Jesus Christ. And the only difference between these two visions is the hair. Everything else is identical. And so, that we are not told who it is exactly that Daniel sees, it could be that just like John, who saw the post-resurrected Christ in all his glory, what Daniel could have seen was the pre-incarnate Christ in all his glory. Again, we are not told who it is, but the parallels are striking. So let's now look at how Daniel responds to this heavenly presence. How does he respond in verses eight through 10? So I was left alone gazing at this great vision and I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. When I heard him speaking and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground and a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Now again, this is a man late in his years, having come through three weeks of fasting Again, he's been mourning, he's been praying, and suddenly, boom, heaven just breaks in on him, and he is flattened, literally. And the other guys run for the hills. They don't even see it, but they feel it, and they just feel fear, and they run. Uh, this is a, a beautiful interaction here, and I just wanna walk through this again. Look at how sweetly this unfolds. So Daniel, he's flattened by this heavenly glory that he encounters. And in verse, verse 10 it says, just then a hand touched me. And in NIV it says, set me upon my hands and knees. But other translations say, it lifted me. He lifted me. And I love that. The hand of God, it never extends to condemn, but it's, it extends to lift us, doesn't it? To lift us. Some of us need that reminder today we need the, the hand of Christ to lift us up, even if we're still trembling on our hands and knees to lift us up, but it doesn't end there. Verse 11, the man said to me, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Other versions say you are beloved or precious to God. Again, this is being spoken over him in his state, and there are some of us here that we need this spoken over us today, don't we? We need to hear that we are again, that we know that we know that we are precious to God. 
We are precious to God, that you are valuable to God, that he loves you, that he cares about you. I mean, if we are gonna stand firm in this faith while living in exile, if we are going to be faithful followers in this foreign land, we need to remember that God cares about us. Amen? We need to remember that we are immeasurably valuable to God, that who you are matters to God, that what you do matters to God. By the way, Daniel is the only, only one of two people in the Bible called beloved. One is Daniel, and the other one is John. John the Apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. And it's interesting to me that both of them wrote great apocalyptic books, having been given incredible visions of Jesus while they were both in their late 80s. So if you're in your 80s, guess what? You've got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> Amen. Well, why does this have to be just written in such detail? I mean, this, this process of this angel or this heavenly being or this pre-incarnate Christ strengthening Daniel and touching him and, and telling him peace and telling him twice, you're beloved. I mean, why a whole chapter on this interaction? Why not just simply say, you know, Daniel had this gut-wrenching encounter with a heavenly being and then he had a vision and then just move on? Why a whole chapter here? Well. What we know from the next two chapters is Daniel is about to be told. He's about to be told of the future battles that Israel will be experiencing right now, just overwhelming, but the vision itself is going to be overwhelming too. And God wants Daniel to know, he wants him to know that no matter what comes, I'm in charge. I am in charge. He wants him to know who the commanding officer is. See, when we face battles in this life, we too need to fix our eyes on the one who has already won the ultimate battle at the cross, amen? Because ultimately, our hope is found. Our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness, amen? His blood and righteousness. So from the concerning problem to a commanding presence, now we start to see behind the curtain a little bit we get to see the contending powers at work behind the scenes. Oh, this is good. In verses 12 through 14. And then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But, okay. But <laughs> the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Did you know that God is doing way, way more than you can see or understand? Do you know that? Let me just first talk to you, those of you who have been praying for a really long time. You've been praying and wondering, is this even worth it? That I keep on praying, that I keep on praying. And if, if you're honest, you've heard that voice in your head at times say, why even bother? Why even bother? I and mean, God doesn't care about what you're praying about. I mean, if God really was gonna do something, he would have done it already. You know, why keep praying? You're just wasting your breath. You know, God's not listening. He's not gonna do it. Maybe it's just not his will. Has anyone ever heard that little voice? Yeah. Well, I want you to hear this. The first time you started praying for that, God heard you. He heard you. He heard your cry. The first time you started praying for healing for that person, God heard your prayer. The first time you started praying for your child and asking God to do a miracle, God heard your prayer. He loves a persistent prayer. Even Jesus in Luke 18 says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable, which was about the persistent widow, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. What we have to remember is this battle is not against flesh and blood, is it? It's not against 
us, is it? That's not the battle that's really going on, but it's against powers and principalities of this dark world. In other words, what you see with your eyes is not all there is. Think about this. Daniel prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he saw what? Nothing for 21 days. He saw nothing. But just because he didn't see anything did not mean that God was not doing something, right? We know this now. God was up to something. And I know that this is probably speaking to someone here today that you've been praying for a really long time. You've been crying out to God and you haven't seen anything. But just because you haven't seen anything does not mean that God is not doing something. He is. And here, we're even told why. We're told why he didn't see anything for 21 days. And I love this. This heavenly being says, I was dispatched the moment you started praying. But it took me, what, 21 days? How long had been Daniel been fasting? 21 days. It took me 21 days to get here because of a supernatural conflict you couldn't see. And even now, his arrival, that heavenly being's arrival, was the immediate result of assistance given by another power angel, Michael, one of the chief princes, to hold off the underlord of Persia. How interesting is this? Really, some of the only few times we ever hear this language about an underlord of Persia. Now, who's this prince of Persia? Well, it's definitely not the human king or even a human being, because it takes two super angels to fight against him, and it takes considerable time in this period of warfare, but the curtain is being pulled back for Daniel to see the real world of the demonic and the angelic. And this should not surprise us one bit. Jesus said of Satan even, he said he is the prince of this world. And Paul, the apostle in Ephesians 2, calls Satan the prince of the power of the air, the one who was at work in the children of disobedience. We need to understand that there is a battle, a battle that we cannot always see, and that not only there is a God in heaven who is fighting for us, but there's also a devil fighting against us, and he's got a, just a big old gang of demonic forces at his beck and call. Listen, if you watch the news, and you look at what's going on in the world, and you think it's just about two political parties at odd with each other, or you think it's just two countries at war with each other, then you're really not seeing the whole picture. We're not seeing the whole picture. That's just spillover from the real battle that's going on in the heavenlies, the real battle. C.S. Lewis said, humanity falls into two equal but opposite errors concerning the devil. There's those who don't take him serious enough, and there's those who take him way too seriously. So there's denial on one hand, and there's obsession on the other hand. I mean, there are. There are people that just flat out deny that there's any spiritual reality whatsoever. If they can't see it, it doesn't exist. And then there are some people who see a devil everywhere and in everything, and they become so obsessed with him and fascinated. Like, let me just say, don't give the devil that kind of attention, okay? <laughs> just don't, not a good way to go. What we need to remember is that there's an unseen battle, unseen forces that are trying to lure you and me away from our loyalty and our faithfulness to Christ, but I want you to also remember this, and this is a truth we need to stand on. The Bible also says, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Amen. We can stand on that. <clears throat> so how do we battle in a war that we cannot see? How do we battle? That brings us to our last point, continuous prayer. The single most important thing that you and I can do as we are living in this foreign land is to pray. In Ephesians 6, 18, it says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Oh, that is a, that is a wonderful verse right there. You know, Daniel's example is this verse right here. This is what he does, and it, it should encourage us, too, to seek God when we are in the midst of great difficulty and to not give up. 
It should not be lost on us that this struggling believer, Daniel, gave himself to prayer and fasting even while he was waiting for that answer. He is on his knees. When you pray, you are pulling out the spiritual big guns. It may not feel like it, but again, the power of prayer is not determined on what you feel, amen? No wonder the deceiver wants to keep us at all costs from engaging in prayer because he knows that's his defeat. Because what are we doing when we pray? We are opening the door to the person he does not want to encounter, which is Jesus, and the kingdom he does not want to go to battle with, which is the kingdom of God. See, if we are gonna be faithful people of God living in this foreign land, we need to remember how powerful prayer is, and we need to continue to pray. Old Housby in his book on prayer says to pray is nothing more involved than to open the door, giving Jesus access to our needs and permitting him to exercise his own power in dealing with them. To pray is to open the door to Jesus. I love how accessible that is. My three-year-old can do that. Jesus, come. Just Jesus, come. Mm. Just as we began this Christian life by opening the door to Christ and saying, come in, so we also move on in our Christian walk by continually opening the door to Christ in prayer. The way in is the way on. Prayer is opening that door, allowing Jesus in all his power, all his power to come in and bring his kingdom. So again, if we wanna see more of the kingdom of God in our city, we need to pray, amen? If we wanna see more of the kingdom in our school systems, we need to pray. If we wanna see more of the kingdom of God in the Middle East, we need to pray. Do you want to see the kingdom of God? Because when you see the kingdom of God come, you get handfuls of heaven. You get to see heaven on earth the way it's supposed to be. See, prayer bridges that gap between what I read in the Bible about the way it's supposed to be and my experience of life as it actually is. We Christians pray to gain Christ and his kingdom. Yes, we wanna see our circumstances change. Yes, we want to see our loved ones' circumstances change, but fundamentally, we know that the greatest need of, the human, of, of all of humanity is Christ himself. That if we had more of Christ, if our loved ones had more of Christ, if the world had more of Christ, we would ex be experiencing more of heaven on earth now. Charles Spurgeon, who was a, and is a famous preacher and pastor in the 19th century, he said this, do not abandon the mercy seat for any reason whatsoever. If it be a good thing that you've been asking for and if you're sure that it's in according to the divine will, if the vision tarry, wait for it. Pray, weep, entreat, wrestle, agonize until you get that which you are praying for. If your heart be cold in prayer, do not restrain prayer until your heart warms, but pray your soul into heat by the help of the ever-blessed Spirit who helps us in our infirmities. Never cease prayer for any sort of reason or argument. Never, <laughs> never, never renounce the habit of prayer or your confidence in its power. Wow. Well, as the worship team comes back up, let me close with this story. <clears throat> There was a Christian woman named Monica <clears throat> who had all kinds of problems with her teenage son. Anyone else here? Woo, no. <laughs> Our teenage sons are great. Um, but this one, this one, he was, he was lazy. He had a really bad temper. He was always getting in fights. Uh, he was always lying. He was stealing stuff. He was a really bright kid, and he was even on the track to become a lawyer, but he just wasn't a nice person at all. He lived with a number of women, and he even had a son by one woman out of marriage. He even got into the occult at one point, but throughout all of his life, Monica kept praying for her son. Day after day, year after year, she prayed and she prayed. And even one day, 
It was a particularly hard day. She even had a vision of Christ smiling at her. And it gave her such encouragement to keep praying that she continued to pray even for another nine years for her son. And at the age of 28, her son finally came to know Christ. Monica's son's name was Augustine, and he's better known as Saint Augustine, and he was one of the most influential theologians the church has produced for about a 1,000 years. And Saint Augustine has always attributed his conversion to his mother's prayers, his mother's prayers. Let me just be really honest with you in closing. Can I just be really honest? God may do exactly what you have been praying for one day, like Monica, he might do it, but he also might not. He also might not on this side of heaven. But just because you don't see anything, don't think that he's not doing something. Don't think he's not doing something. Do not give up praying. Do not give up. People are going to look at your life and they are gonna wonder, how are you still standing? How are you still hanging in there? How come you haven't given up? And my prayer is that we would be people who can say in faith, I haven't given up because I know that God cares about me more than I even realize. And he's doing way more than I understand. And he's given me tools to fight even now while I'm waiting to even tap into his strength so that I can keep standing. And I continue to believe that the first time I prayed, he heard my prayer. And I trust that he is good and that he is working in all things to bring about the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I am not gonna give up praying Just because I don't see anything doesn't mean that God is not doing something. That is how, that is how we are people who keep standing in this foreign land. Amen? Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand? Let's go ahead and stand. As the worship team starts to play here, we're going to take some time to take communion together. So if you haven't picked up the elements, go ahead and feel free to grab those, bring those back to your seats. And if you're online, I even invite you to join us in taking communion as well. But if you are here today and maybe, maybe you're curious about Jesus, maybe today you're even sensing his presence like a weight in the room. I just wanna say, you know, he wants you, he wants you to do like what we talked about today and open the door to him. Open the door and let him in to allow him to lead your life moving forward. As we take this time of corporate communion, if that's you, I encourage you to make the decision today to pray and to ask Jesus to come into your life today. And if that's you, we would love to pray for you and bless that decision that you make today. When taking communion, we are both remembering and proclaiming the gospel message of Christ's life, his death and resurrection. So with your families and friends, let's take the bread and the cup together. Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Thank you. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink the cup together. Lord, we do. We just thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for us, for the forgiveness of our sins and for giving us life and relationship with you forever. Amen. So as we go back into worship, if you feel like the Lord gives you a word or a picture, feel free to come over and share it with Michael here. Let's lean into God's presence this morning and let's worship together.
love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless and on wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Oh, you would lay down your life. That I would be set that you've done for me. share a new song. Maybe you've connected with it already, but we're going to worship to the song called Firm Foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. 
I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Got you. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. And he's never let me down. Faithful in every season, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't
With all of my All of my All of my soul And all of my strength Jesus I love you With all of my We just say, Jesus, we love you. Just come right now, Lord. We just want to take a moment and rest in your presence. Lord, you have the floor right now. Just come. Come, Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm. More. More, Holy Spirit. Just fill us up. Mm. I know that uh, Michael, um, there was a few words that were shared. <clears throat> you want to come on up? <laughs> Hi, my name is Tony, and I may cry because I feel God on it, but mm. forgive me if I do. Um, there's a thing called a narcissistic projection, which means someone can own what they dislike about themselves, so they say, you're it, you're horrible, you're crazy, you're an addict, you're a bad person. And what I felt like God was saying is the enemy is, 
is a narcissist and he's been telling you most of your life that you're awful, that you're crazy, that you're not going to make it. And yet God mm. is not a narcissist and he says you are beloved. Yeah. That you're cherished. That you have a purpose. Yeah. And I feel like God wants to break some of the chains from the past so you could hear him say, you are deeply beloved. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Uh, we had actually three other words that were really similar in theme and it was just a reminder uh, and encouragement not to give up, but yeah. to keep on, uh, keep on praying. Jesus is with you and loves to hear your prayers. And then one person just came up and just said, you know, just a reminder that many of us are here today and we're, we're in a place of believing in God and faith in God because of praying parents Ooh. or praying grandparents. And mm -hmm. so I just want to encourage you, one, to celebrate that if that's you, but, but if you're a parent or a grandparent to, again, to not give up. And then I just had a picture of, of someone sick in a hospital bed and they were getting a needle, which doesn't sound great, but it was good. On the needle, it was written faith. And I just saw God mm. infusing faith, and that really ties in with this theme of not giving up something. Amen, yeah. Uh, the, the word that I had was, um, just really believe that God wants to do today, is really from verse 17, which we didn't cover today. But Daniel says, my strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. And that's some of you right now. But then in verse 18, it says, then the one who looked like a man touched me again. And what happened? Daniel said, I felt my strength returning. My strength returning. Don't miss the power of this. When he touched me, I felt my strength returning. And that is what some of us need this morning. We need a touch from Jesus. We need that one touch from him to keep us going. And uh, I just really believe that's, that there's some of you here today, you need supernatural strength from the Lord to keep praying, to keep persevering, to keep faithful to Christ amidst this, this place that we find ourselves in. I had a picture too of, this is gonna sound strange, but I'll go with it, of um, I think it was an older man, and you have like a salt and pepper beard. And I don't know if there's anyone here that has a little bit of stubble or like some salt and pepper beard going on, but I really felt like the word that Tony had was for you. And I just saw the Lord cupping your face. Again, this is, I'm taking a risk here, but he's cupping your face and he's just, he's just shaving your beard and he's tending you and he's caring for you and you're his child. No matter how old you are, you are his beloved. And he sees you this morning and wants you to be reaffirmed of his love for you. So if these words apply, if they, they resonate in you, please respond this morning by coming forward for prayer. We're gonna pray for one another as we sing this last worship song. But I really believe that this is what God wants to do today. He wants to infuse us with that faith, amen? He wants to infuse us with strength to keep persevering ahead, to keep praying for the things that we have been praying for, amen? So let's go ahead and come forward while we worship this in this last song. I just want to share that testimony. I believe that I'm here on earth because of praying parents. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. And uh, I just had a sense that if you did want to intercede for your children, or if you had a strong sense that, hey, that was me, or for your grandchildren, maybe you could come forward and even someone could join with you in praying for them. If you'd like to come forward, you can come forward now if you'd like. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. You are. 
If you're receiving prayer, we just bless what God is doing. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to close the rest of us in a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us. And we do, we just pray that you would continue to pour in us, that you would give us hearts that long to just continually open the door to you and your kingdom. Pray that you would give your people strength, strength, supernatural strength to continue to stand. I just wanna close with the lines from this hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what a peace we often forfeit, and oh, what a needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Mm. May we carry it all to you, Jesus, amen, amen. Well, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend to all of you, and if you're a woman here and you haven't yet bought your tickets for the brunch, we would love for you to do that right after the service. And also, if you're a guy, we need guy volunteers. So if you're willing, we need your help. If you could sign up today, that would be great. Bless you guys.